Hello and welcome to HD's weekly talk show, The Interview, and our special segment, Reaching Out with HD. She is the first woman director in a 107-year-old institution. Known as the Lady of Flies, she is trained to calculate the time of death by examining the flies around a body. Equally, she is interested in insects. Her work slogan, Someday the sari will soar higher than the shirt. An interesting mix. Let us meet Dhriti Banerjee, the first woman director of the Zoological Survey of India in this edition of HD's weekly talk show, The Interview, in our special segment, Reaching Out with HD. Welcome to the show, Dhriti Banerjee, and thank you for being here with us. Namaskar. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Thank you. As the first woman director of the Zoological Survey of India, how does it feel? To chair the post of Director Zoological Survey of India. And for the first time in 107 years as a woman, it was, what would I say, a mixed bag of feelings. It was an immense achievement. Why a mixed bag? It should just have been a bag full of happiness. Yes, it, it was happiness but along with it along with it the chair also came with a lot of responsibility because i was carrying a legacy of over 100 years of an organization on my shoulders it was not only happiness uh, like pure happiness or pure joy it wasn't like that i was happy i was feeling fulfilled i was satisfied i was grateful to god for giving me the opportunity to uh, basically lead an organization in this capacity and hence naturally I felt that I have to work a way lot more than I worked previously. When you took over people said you have created history. You disagreed and took one back to 1949. As you rightly said and as I also had previously said that uh, is it's true that the history goes back in 1949 when the first female scientist was recruited in Zoological Survey of India. So that is where the history began. The sadness of it is that from 1914, even if the history was a big, I mean, initiated in 1949, it that time frame was set, but it took 107 years and the present Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change to ultimately have a lady sitting on the chair of director. You work with animals, to put it simply. What does your job entail? Our job as scientists of Zoological Survey of India is to explore, discover and inventorize the faunal diversity of the country. Say, for example, as of today, India has 1,3718 species, which is which belongs to our country. Our job is documentation of this. Not only are we documenting the fauna, but also at the same time, we are also assessing the importance of the role of these animals in our ecosystem. Very simply, if I say the food which we are eating, that is coming from crops, that is the cereals or the fruits, all of them need insects for pollinating their flowers and for fruiting. So suppose our job is assessing these insects, considering the fact that their important role in providing this major ecosystem service. So our job is to find out which are the different types of insects which can pollinate. How are these pollinators thri thriving? Is there anything which is affecting the thriving or propagation of these pollinators? If so, what should be the mitigating, uh, uh, mitigating systems which should be put into place so that they are allowed to breed and they are uh, they are allowed to breed and they thrive and they keep on pollinating the our uh, food. Uh, I mean, keep on pollinating and have uh, provide us with a very robust food system so that we have food on our plates every day. So this is a very small example of an insect which I'm giving. We are working on the entire spectrum of animals present in our country, from protozoa to mammalia, as we say, and simplistically say, from entamoeba, which cause your amoebic dysentery, to the elephant. 
We covered the entire spectrum thrown in between other fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, the frogs, the insects, the corals, the uh, starfishes, the mollusks, the cells, the snails, the uh, what would I say, the leeches, the earthworms. There isn't anything which you see which is an animal and not a man and which is crawling and which is walking and which is moving, which doesn't come under our purview. Wow, that is a handful. Yes, but absolutely. while on insects, it is your interest in insects, which was the turning point. Take me through that journey and please, in a simple language, because I, for one, cannot even pronounce the words of the work you do. Okay, uh, I understand. The problem with the scientists is that you always end up using technical terms in however uh, simplistically way we think that we are doing. I was doing my PhD on the physiological effects of you know commonly abused drugs in both humans as well as in animal models. And uh, it so happened that I had just left one of my animal carcasses on the uh, table on Friday and it was supposed to be cleared out by the cleaning person. And he was not there on that day or he forgot. And then next week, after the weekend, when I came back in the morning and I saw on my table, firstly, the whole room was stinking and my professor was shouting and jumping up and down. Why did you not clean it? Blah, blah, blah. And then when I go and saw on the table, on the carcass, on the carcass it was filled with small, small maggots, which were crawling all over. That kind of made me, I got very excited. But then my job was something different. My PhD problem was something different. So I, I, you know, I carried on with my PhD work and finished and then got the doctoral degree awarded. And at the same year, I also, the year I submitted my PhD and I was awarded my PhD, the same year I also got the job in Zoological Survey of India. And as I say, luck by chance that I was assigned to the Diptera section and then I found a renewal of the interest of working on those flies and the what I'd seen in my laboratory five years or two, three years back. So that was the way I started off. You know, take me through your first experience at work when you said, ki jaga bhi nahi hai. 1998, I had joined Zoological Survey of India. At that point of time, there were very few women there in ZSI at that point of time. Initially, what had happened, because the whole section was full and there was no spare table to sit or spare table chair to sit. So that point of time, people had, some of the people of the uh, had gone on survey. So those were the tables which were empty. And then I was said, OK, you sit on any of the table. So what happened is that when these people came back, I used to shift from one table to another and one chair to another, according to the availability of the person at that point of time. The work environment in Zoological Survey of India was such and the camaraderie among the people was such that I never felt that I wasn't being given a chair. I always looked at it in that way that there was even if there was no chair, I was offered a chair to sit. Even if the fact that I was sitting in somebody else's chair and table. You have always debunked the concept of a glass ceiling and said it is in the head. This actually is a departure from the norm where women have to work doubly hard to get to the top. So uh, what happens that we always have this uh, concept of women breaking the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling, now the question is who sets the glass ceiling? The glass ceiling is not set by a man or the glass ceiling is not set by God. It is a kind of thing which we figure or we think that is preventing us from moving forward or moving upwards. So that is the reason why I say that the glass ceiling is in the head. It is not in the system. The system will be always having a efficient person and a not so efficient person and a slightly less efficient person. And the system may be expecting the efficient person to rise to the top, the not so efficient person, less efficient person to be second and the not so efficient person to end up last. So this is a system which always has been in place. And women have been kept thinking about it that we are not being allowed to move forward because of what is pulling us from behind. But what I personally feel that everything is about your will to push forward. 
So the glass ceiling is somebody is something which we think exists, but that is exactly which is uh, in our head, and it is a kind of a smoke screen which prevents us from moving ahead or surging ahead. So have you always had it easy, or did you ever face a gender bias? It would be wrong to say that I always had it easy. It was difficult all the time because. I always competed with men. Gender bias is something which I would say I was lucky not to be directly hit by it, with it on my face. It, if it was there, it was in a very subtle way. How and why ZSI? Ah, uh, it wasn't like how and uh, there was no specific reason. I would say what happened was that I had. Uh, submitted my PhD. I had also applied for a job in ZSI and I had also applied for a job in the colleges, in the uh, uh, department, zoology departments, the different state run government colleges. So it's the, I had got the offer letter for joining Zoological Survey of India before I had got the offer letter for joining the college. ZSI was something which was some absolutely new to me. Therefore, I'm intrigued. Why ZSI? So when it came in, I had gone to my college and then I asked my professors that, sir, I've got an offer from ZSI. Uh, so what should I do? And then and my professor had said, professor had said that you go, you take up the job. It's a central government organization. It has huge, it's a huge setup and it will be a wonderful place to work. And so I decided, okay, fine. It'll be something which I didn't know. So take it up, take it up in my stride and it will be something new to work on. And that's the reason I came into ZSI. That, and also the fact that I had got the offer letter before the other offer letter. So I guess, you know, I took it up as a first choice. But the fact that you would be working with animals, didn't that deter you? No. Actually, when I joined, I didn't have that much of, uh, I mean, I couldn't figure it out that how it's going to, how it is going to go. So then when I went there and then when the first survey came, and then I was uh, I got to know that I had to go to Arunachal Pradesh on a survey a tour. So that time I started thinking. That time it was exciting also in the sense that I had no clue about what a survey was. So when we went on a survey, I then realized that it was a direct interaction with the animals which we are studying in the book. You get to see them live in the jungles, in their own natural habitats. And that was a thrill which I would say is unparalleled. So that thrill basically pushes everybody in ZSI. Whoever other scientists who are working in ZSI, they're always, they are always after this thrill of going out in the field and working. So that is a reason why I guess we keep going. When we are going out, we encounter the birds, the mammals, the snakes, the frogs, the lizards. So that is something which you get to see right in front of you. And that is a different experience altogether. At the ZSI, you trace the grave of the first director general of the organization. Yes, we had uh, traced uh, the grave of Dr. Thomas Nelson Annandale, the founder, director of Zoological Survey of India. The finding of the grave was very important for us and we did it on the centenary year of ZSI, which was in 1915. So we had completed 100 years and we thought that it would be important for us to uh, go and find out the grave and place a wreath on the founder director or the wreath of the grave, the grave of the founder director of Zoological Survey of India commemorating 100 years of ZSI. Talking of graves and death, you are trained to calculate the time of death by examining the flies around the body. This is fascinating and something I and perhaps many of our viewers don't know. Yes, that is something which is in my line of research and which basically we are, the, we are one of the pioneers in working on this forensic flies which can detect the time of death, the post-mortem interval and can also detect the place of death and the reason behind the death. 
what happens when there is a dead body they will be the flies will be it starts decomposing it re releases volatile amino acids and then the flies get attracted to it and they come down and they lay their eggs in the holes or the apertures of the body like the nose the ears and the mouth and the maggots will go inside the body and they will start feeding on the dead flesh and they start growing so the larval instars or the i mean the growing larva becomes the uh, de designatory for the time of death it can we can understand the developmental stages of the larva by their length and then we can understand that when the body was killed if the larva if the gut contents of the larva is assessed then we can also understand whether the person was poisoned or the where the person was basically killed suppose a person was killed in some place and moved elsewhere then the silicon content in the gut can determine the kind of soil where he was killed and where he was and then where the body was found so tell me why doesn't the police then take the help of your organization in investigating crimes does it or does it not or is there some coordination or something needs to be done in this direction uh, the reason why police is uh, not involved, uh, I mean, it doesn't involve us for the simple reason is that that uh, because there are some ethical reasons when you are dealing with human corpses. So we there are certain laboratories who are given the license for working with, with human bodies. So we are basically working on the fauna. So we are doing the research on the fly as a model for detecting crimes. And so the actual evidence on field has to be dealt with the lab, uh, the institutions who have the basically the ethical clearance for working with human bodies. That is the reason why the we are not directly involved in it. We are more in, involved in the way of providing inputs or as a research component of it. That is the reason. But don't you think if the red tape is cut, it would help the system in general at a macro level? Yes, definitely it would. It would provide additional uh, evidence to it. And if you see in Western countries, they are using this this uh, I mean uh, uh, this system of using forensic evidence from insects. Forensically important evidence. Uh, insects are a very important source of evidence as well as for uh, and also our primary witnesses in convictions also. But here, since it is not in place, so there has to be, if the red tape is cleared, then what happens is that it broadens an avenue, it broadens another field. Uh, in due course of time, this may be, I'm hopeful, is going to happen. As head of your organization, wouldn't you push for this? Yes, I would, definitely. But there are so many also parallel areas where pushing will be more, uh, I mean, parallelly more important. So what, ha what happens is that we are... Like, you know, we are trying to move for it also. But then there's a lot of things to be involved. It is not only my organization directly communicating to the government because this will be involving the Ministry of Environment for us. It will be involving the uh, Ministry of Law and Justice. It will be involving the Ministry of Home Affairs. It will be involving the different Ministry of Human Resources. So I guess roping all together, all of them in one place will take some time. But you would put this on your priority list? I would put it. Definitely, I would put it in my priority list. Coming back to gender bias, you have said that you have had to balance, and I quote, the masculinity of your position with the femininity of your job without getting caught in a double bind. Wow. Please decode this for me. I have been, I mean, uh, standing in these shoes of, I mean, these administrative positions for, for over basically 10 to 15 years. And every time all these positions were previously run by men. And it was, I was the first person to basically take up these administrative positions. And that point of time, I realized that the way initially people were a bit skeptical about how it is going to set in place there was a kind of question marks which were put in on my capacity on my output and my efficiency but what happens is that because i was a woman there were certain things which would be in my notice which a man may not notice at all suppose there were some dignitaries or some senior member officials from the ministry coming in so 
who is going to organize a table, who is going to decide on the food, who is going to decide on what would be the events taking place. That was also on my, that was also a part of my responsibility. Okay. Okay. So over a period of time, I realized that it is a balancing act which we do. We have to basically, the hand that rocks the cradle, rules the world. That is the way it should be. And that is the way I took it on my stride. And I guess that is why I'm here today also. You actually took classes and professional help to be groomed as director of the ZSI. Yes, that is true. I had taken professional assistance for uh, grooming myself, preparing myself for the interview. I mean, it's starting from the very basics, how I walk, how I sit, how I talk, what will be my body posture, how will I gain confidence, how should I be speaking out, where I should, how I should modulate my voice. Other than the fact like my subject, my research, that was not touched upon. That was the way I prepared myself. But uh, I had basically taken professional help. This sounds like a film audition. Do you think that was necessary? And wasn't your professional expertise more important than how you talk or how you carry yourself? Never before in history was a, in the for the post of director, there was more than four applications ever. This was the first time we had 20 applicants for the post and eight of us had been shortlisted for the interview. So this time we had eight candidates. So the competition was very stiff. And then I realized that most of us were almost, you know, at par with each other professionally because we were going from the same feeder grade. So the difference, the edge which I had to, which I needed would come from a different aspect where I guess that others will not be having. So I was looking for that extra edge. And that is the reason why I had gone in and taken professional help and professional coaching. Till you didn't start working, you didn't know how to cook. So do I take it that to be in the ZSI, cooking is essential? <laughs> now that is a very interesting. I didn't know how to cook because I grew up in a joint family and there was no necessity for me to cook. And that was a primary reason. And in ZSI, what happened is that when we are in the field, we are we usually had to stay in circuit houses where we would have to cook our own meals coming back from the field and after a long day of survey. So you naturally, when I'm there and they will be looking at me with very quizzical eye, my teammates, that you don't even know how to cook rice. You don't even know how to cook dal. So that I thought was a kind of a, a thing. It was a kind of a quality which I was not, which I didn't possess. And so I realized that, okay, I must also learn how to go ahead with it and learn how to cook, especially for people who are other than outside my family. And that's the way I, I guess I picked up the art of cooking also. Hmm. Finally, your work slogan, the sari will soar higher than the shirt. This slogan about the sari is going to soar higher than the shirt is it's I feel it's all about women empowerment. It's about the confidence women should build in them in themselves, the conf the faith and the belief each woman woman must have inside her and in her head that she can be she will be able to make it and she is going to make it big. Driti Banerjee, thank you very much. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Namaskar.